Last week, we, um, just to recap on a couple of the things that we, we talked about, we start, I started on um, this kind of mini-series within the series uh, on arising into maturity. And we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at how the church that is called into maturity is also the church that is called to embrace suffering and trials. And we discussed how in Hebrews 12, um, it says that God disciplines those he loves. And so if we really trust in his goodness, we should be looking and actually inviting that challenge uh, in our life and God to, uh, us to say to God, I want your discipline. I want you to grow me. I want you to form me and shape me. And we're to not do that in a begrudging sense where we... we kind of almost like, oh, I guess this is something I have to get through. This is something I, I kind of I resentingly um, endure. But as something that we say, I recognize that God has a bigger plan, a bigger picture, and he wants to grow me into the man that he's, or woman that he's called us to be. And so that's what we, we looked at in a nutshell last uh, week. And so today, I want us to shift gears a little. And I was going to say I wanted to go into a bit of a pastoral side, but I'm not very pastoral. And <laughs> Claire, I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and to those who know me, yeah, th- those who know me will know that I, I pastorally, uh, it's not my gifting, not my calling. Um, but I want to look at a few things. I'll say I want to give us some practical tools this morning. Because last week, if we talked about that calling, that mantle for us to say, As we step into maturity, we recognize we're going to be put to the test. Um, Rightly, a lot of people kind of anticipated what I was going to talk on this week, which is they said, I've been in a lot of tests. (laughs) And I'm I'm still walking through those things. Uh, And actually, I want to give us some tools on how to discern that. So we're going to look at a couple of things. The first is, if you're going through something, one of the key questions that you'll probably be asking is, how do I know whether this is the discipline of the Lord or an attack of the enemy? Because depending on what it is, also depend, like it decides how we approach that. Because if there's something that is a, a, an attack on our lives, then we deal with it very differently to how we would walk through something that we know the Lord is testing us on and, and trying to give us character on. And so we want to look at how we discern the difference And then we're going to look at actually how we walk through that full stop. So how we walk through trials. Because one of the things as well that uh, I want to cover is that sometimes we get stuck in cycles of trials. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've spoken uh, over the past couple of years of of ministry. I've spoken to so many people where they seem to be stuck in this never-ending cycle of trials. And sometimes it's just one different thing after another. And they, they describe it as like they can barely like swim and catch their breath. They can barely grasp air. And it just seems to be something else that then hits them. And then other occasions, there seems to be things where people are walking through the same thing over and over again. And I want to hopefully just explore and unlock of some of why that might be. So for those with Bibles, um, I invite you to turn to John 10.10. 10. Um, we'll look at that in uh, a few minutes. And the first thing I want us to do when we're contemplating this question of um, is this an attack or an opportunity for discipline is we have to remove our own expectations of what is in our best interest. So for those of the Bibles, John 10, 10. Years ago... Um, when I was straight out of Bible college and I was in the, my, my first job, um, there was no doubt in my mind that I was where God had called me to be. And for all the challenges of the job that I had, it had a lot of job satisfaction and I felt very fulfilled in it. And I was in it for about five years or so. And um, in that time, Rebecca had... And I had our first two sons, Ezra and Solomon. 
And let me just paint you the picture of my walk with God at that point, because this is, you'll see why this is pertinent. So at that time, all the time while I was in that job, I'd get up at 5.30 in the morning, I'd spend time reading the scriptures, and then I had a long list of people who I was just praying and interceding for. Um, I'd spend quality time praying in tongues, And then when I'd go to work, I actively saw it as my opportunity, my mission field to bring revival to that place. Because I was like, if God's put me here, then I'm to be his light. And so I spent my time praying for people, witnessing and praying for healing. I saw people come to the Lord in that time from those who I was working with. Um, I saw people healed. There's this one occasion where when I first started there, I was so, I felt so on fire for God. Um, I used to, I don't think I was meant to, but who cares? Um, I used to just have people lined up at the desk. I kid you not. And because they knew that I was the, the really outspoken Christian guy. And I just wanted to tell them about Jesus and the fact that he wasn't something that uh, someone where they had to be perfect to approach a church. And so they, they would come. And, and I remember one time this guy saying, describing how he'd been stabbed through the hand um, as a child because his dad had a temper and he'd always had like a, a shake in it the whole time. And I just felt this moment of faith where I said, well, would you like me to pray for that? Because Jesus will heal your hand. And um, we prayed, and right as we were praying, his hand just becomes absolutely calm. And he's freaking out. and like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you, you, how that did that. And I said, no, it's not, not me. This is Jesus. And we ended up, um, le- uh, led him to the Lord. And, and so I was in a place where I was like, God, I want to see the harvest. If I'm here, I want to see you move in power. And I remember I used to do walks around the building and I'd be praying in tongues and and casting out um, demons from rooms and um, not publicly, that part I kept to myself. I didn't want people to um, totally freak out. But I would, I really saw it as my, my mission field. And so I had this expectation of where I was growing with God and where I needed my discipleship. I had areas that I had mapped out in my mind for where my growth with God would go. And then things started to get difficult. I, Rebecca had given up her job um, as we'd had two kids at this point. And we, she felt that God had said, stay at home, be a full-time mom. I was the father. I was like, I'm going to, I'm working hard. That's what God's called me to do. I'm going to bring home the money. I'll support us. We ended up buying a house uh, and moving to this community because we wanted to be rooted with this church. And so in my mind, I was doing everything right. And then the challenges started to come because things started to break in my house and I didn't have the money to fix them. And the bills started mounting up. And I started feeling so stressed and under pressure. And I couldn't make sense of it because in my mind, I was doing everything that I should be doing. I was praying regularly. I was delving into the word, spending time with God. My family structure was one that I wanted to honor God and represent that. I was like working to, I'm I'm not expecting, you know, anything in return. I'm just wanting to to get what I earn and I want to be able to make my own way. And yeah, I still wasn't like covering bills every month and it was causing me an awful lot of stress. But if you'd asked me in that season, where does God need to grow you? It was, oh, he needs to grow me in my my faith in his power for healing and ministry because that's where my attention was. That's where my focus was. So I had identified where God could shape me, God could disciple me, and it wasn't in my home life. It wasn't in my finances. Does that make sense? So the financial pressure starts to creep up, and despite the fact of working long hours, I was still just not making ends meet. So from my perspective, again, let's just remember, I had made myself the arbitrator of my own discipleship. So that means I decided what things I was proficient on and where my areas for growth were. 
So from my perspective, the decisions that had led me to that point were all from God. I was in a job that I felt called to. Rebecca was where she, she felt called to be. And I wanted our family to be honoring God. And yet I still wasn't making ends meet. And I was still struggling. I was still in a trial that I couldn't see a way out of. You can see why it was really easy for me in that position to come to the conclusion that the things that were happening to me were attacks from the enemy. Because as in the verse that it says in John 10.10, it says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'll come back to that again in a minute, but all I will say now is that I applied those criteria for the enemy's activity to my circumstances without discernment. I was looking into the circumstance and the situation and asking myself if I personally felt attacked. And in doing so, I placed myself, all my internal worldview, my behaviors, my character, as the bar standard for divine intervention. Because surely God would not put me through a situation that in my own judgment, nothing good could come from. In that given situation, it was easy to see how the enemy was trying to steal and destroy my ability to provide financially for my family. And from my perspective, that was the only thing I could see because I'd looked at my life and how I handled finances. I tithed, I worked hard, I provided for my family, and I, was, I determined that I was doing okay and I didn't need to grow in that area. So what I was facing, I reasoned, must be from the enemy. Sometimes, though, what God does in your life to build you up will have to start with tearing stuff down. And to the undiscerning, it will feel more like death and destruction because it hurts. 2 Corinthians 10 says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking uh, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, is what it says. It's Christians who are the subject of that verse. Paul says, we are taking every thought captive. And so when we talk about um, that verse and destroying strongholds, the first place we need to look is actually for where they're located, is it within our own life? And we need to look to Jesus to show where those are. In that season for me, despite having all my stuff supposedly in order, the discipline of the Lord was on me to break the strongholds, systems, expectations down in my life so that he could rebuild it with something that would enable me to bear more fruit. In that case, in that season, it took me another two years to recognize that the perceived attack on my finances was God saying in his mercy, I've called you to something greater, but I can't lead you there if you're taking old mindsets and paradigms that aren't up to my standard with you. Even though I hadn't judged that to be an area where I needed work, so it colored my perspective of what, God, like, what I could imagine God trying to do. So back to my point. If you're trying to discern a situation, whether a situation is an attack from the enemy or not, don't look to whether it is painful or destructive because sometimes God is looking at things in our life that we think we have got together. And he's saying, I need to break that down so I can build something back up. Let me explain it slightly differently. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, I went with my family to Clumber Park. Has anyone ever been to, to Clumber Park in, in Nottinghamshire? Beautiful place. I love going there. And on this particular day, it was kind of on and off rain. And so we took shelter in um, these beautiful greenhouses that are in this walled garden. And we're walking through. And the thing about a greenhouse is they are designed to produce abundance. So you choose what soil you put in a greenhouse, yeah? 
You can choose the, the nature, the, the different levels that you want in it. You can add stuff to it, totally uninterfered by the outside world. You can choose how much water it gets. And you can even adjust the temperature in that, that building. So you're creating this ultimate environment for growth and abundance. And as I was going through, they had these beautiful grapevines that were growing up the insides of the greenhouse. And as I looked at the grapevines, there was a, a vine dresser in one of the kind of compartments. And as I looked, these, um, the branches were heavy laden with grapes. But they were absolutely minuscule. They were huge bunches of grapes, loads of fruit, but the grapes were really tiny and not at all like the, you know, the big succulent grapes that you'd see in the, the supermarket. And I thought, I was like, this is really bizarre because they have the ultimate environment here. They've got as much water as they need. They've got the perfect soil. They've got the right climate. So why are these grapes so small? So I actually went to the vine dresser and I said, is this like what, in my naivety, I was like, is this what normal grapes look like? Are the grapes we're fed like some sort of mutants? And he went, no. He said, he, he started at the bottom of the vine and he started to show me all these um, little scars where he had nicked off branches and they're kind of, they'd healed over. And he said, well, these were a few weeks ago. And he kind of worked his way up. And then he said, well, and these parts, he said, these are um, to encourage the vine to grow. And then he got to the actual bunches of grapes and he took me to a different... Um, greenhouse where the grapes were really large and he said in order to make the grapes grow I actually had to remove a whole load of the fruit and he said I go in with these like special um, like scissors he said and I go into the bunch of grapes and I take out about 50 60 percent of the grapes from the the bunch he said and it gives the rest space to actually grow and I was really amazed by that because I had no idea. And I'm not particularly, um, like, I don't consider myself a gardener. But in my mind, pruning was something you did to branches, leaves, and life that was kind of dead or it was decaying. So it was like, oh, that doesn't look like it's healthy. I'll cut that off. I never imagined you would do it to perfectly healthy fruit or at least what I perceived as perfectly healthy fruit. Do you remember last week when I said that good teaching, worship, and fellowship were not the markers of a mature church? If you're looking at maturity by just what you're consuming, even though those things are critically important, then you will grow, but you won't reach maturity. Those vines had everything externally that they could possibly have needed and they would never have reached maturity without the intervention of someone actually going in and removing something that, from my perspective, was perfectly healthy. If you had asked me how to get those grapes growing, I'd have been immediately looking to all the external things. I'd have been saying, is the soil right? Does it get enough water? Surely it can't be getting enough water. Maybe it's not warm enough. I would not have considered removing something that was actually that looked perfectly fine from my perspective. The vine, grew, uh, vine tender knew that though. The church in the West has done this. We have created greenhouses in our communities, and again, not a bad thing in themselves, that have insulated us from the world. So we have at our disposal, you could go on YouTube right now, you could have your choice of the best teaching in the world, the best worship. You can even, when you come to Lincoln, I don't know, uh, I'm hoping it's, it's the Holy Spirit that drew you here, but theoretically, you have your choice of any church. You could even move if you wanted and go and, and be near a church that's like got it all going on. You could surround yourselves with all the things that you draw in, but it will not equal maturity. In my case, when I was in that place in, in my first job and things started getting difficult, I found it difficult to understand why I would be in that situation because I was looking to the external factors on what I might be lacking. I was saying, God, do I need to just press in more? Do I need to read my Bible even more? Do we need to up the time that I'm spending praying in tongues? It's the soil, it's the water, it's the environment. 
we can change and modify those things. They don't instinct, uh, necessarily bring about maturity. The discipline of God will require the apparent destruction of what we may deem to be good stuff in our lives. But it is Jesus, the vine dresser, who can see the calling that he has placed upon you and wants to remove what you have grown so you can bear more fruit. I want us to relook at the challenges in our lives through that lens this morning. The first step, therefore, in discerning if something is from God is not to step, or it is for us to step out of the judgment seat of our own discipleship and walks with God and allow God to show us if there's perhaps something in our lives that he wants to prune that we thought was doing all right. So back to that verse, John 10, 10. I wonder if we can have it up. The thief only comes, or comes only, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. If the thief is the enemy, then I want to go back to the first encounter that we have with him in Scripture. As being in the garden, the one who came to steal the innocence and the inheritance of mankind, to introduce death into the world and attempt to destroy the relationship between God and man by introducing sin. The enemy's calling card is sin and its consequences. We know that God can tear down, but it is always to build up. And whilst it can be painful, it will never be brought about through sin. The wages of sin are death. And the fallen and broken world we live in is as a result of what we call the fall. So after Adam and Eve sin, sin comes in and wreaks havoc in the world and introduces things that did not previously exist. So whilst I want to apply the following rule with caution, as I honestly believe that God will use any situation to grow us and to bring us to maturity, he can use anything. As a general rule, circumstances and situations that flow from sin and the fall are not from God. God, who is the creator and sustainer of life, and who by his own carnation in Jesus demonstrated that he comes into the world to heal, did therefore not inflict life-threatening diseases and situations upon you. Can a person be drawn closer to God and learn stuff in a season when they're battling a mental condition? Absolutely. Of course he can. Did God put that on them to learn something? Absolutely not. It's really important as we move forward um, with, as we grow into maturity as a church, I've seen so many times where those things, that wanting to embrace the goodness of God and what he can do, leads us to an almost fatalistic uh, approach where everything that happens to us is, it must be the will of God. God did not create cancer. God did not create disease to take life. One of the reasons why we say it's so crucially important to be embedded in the word, to know the word of God, is because it reveals the character of God. How many times when, you know when you hear um, like malicious gossip or things that are said about people, do you know the best way to stop that is by actually knowing the person? So, you know, as a, a church leader, I, I meet with other church leaders and uh, I get to know them and I, I have a particular friend who's in a nearby church and you hear stuff all the time from Christians who carry wounding and hurt and they'll say, oh, such and such did that. And I'll say, no, he didn't. I don't have to be there because I know that it's not in their character. I know that I know them. And so I know they wouldn't do that. The importance of knowing your scripture is it allows us to know the creator and his character to discern what is and isn't of him. Yeah. When we look at the trials that we face, we have to understand the nature and the character of God so that we can discern whether something is from God or not. 
But I am saying now for us as a church, I do not believe that God sends those uh, life-threatening, life-limiting sicknesses and, uh, or, or death on people. And so those are examples where the church is called to, to step into the authority that it has by the blood of Jesus and say we are a kingdom people and we are called to actively reverse the effects of the fall in the world. We are the light in the world. I think on a practical level, one of the reasons it's so important to be rooted in community as well is because sometimes the best clarity and perspective we can get on a situation is from those who are walking the journey around us. So this is just a real practical tip. People who come alongside us and speak not from the flesh, but from the spirit to discern if something is it's something that can bring life or whether it's something the enemy has created to harm you. Or, in, as is often the case, whether something is simply the consequences of our own sin. You know, in all this, though, whether something is discipline from God or an attack of the enemy or simply our own sin reaping its harvest, only God, only God could bring about fruit to the people who submit themselves to him in every trial. The next thing I want us to turn to is uh, Psalm, 100, uh, sorry, not 157, um, 57 verses 1 uh, sorry, four to nine. I got each part of that wrong in turn. <laughs> I didn't even say one part of that right. Psalm 57, verses four to nine, and we have that up on the, the screen. So just as we're finding that, the context of this verse is this. David, before he's king, he is, um, has been anointed by the prophet Samuel, and Samuel has prophesied over him and said, you are gonna be the next king of Israel. He then rises to prominence in Israel. He slays Goliath. He becomes a mighty war hero. He has favor with almost all of Israel. And suddenly, the existing king, King Saul, who's lost his anointing, God says, I've taken my spirit from him, turns against him, and then actively is pursuing his life. So when David is writing this psalm, he is being chased for something that he didn't do. It's kind of starting to sound like the, um, the A-team. Um, you know, he's like, he's pursued for something that he, he didn't do, uh, for crimes he didn't commit. And, um, and he's in a lot of turmoil because the injustice from his point of view is like this, my, the king who I thought is my friend is pursuing my life, someone clo- the closest to me, and I am in peril. David writes on the back of that trial, my soul is amongst lions. I must lie down among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are like spears and arrows and their tongue as sharp as a sword. He's painting this vivid picture of death that surrounds him. Then it says, verse 5, Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. There's something uniquely beautiful about spending time with God in the midst of trial. But I think people misunderstand how we're called to interact with God in those circumstances. Okay? The first bit of that psalm is describing his plight. So who's he describing it to, first of all? Who's his attention focused to? It's God. 
He's sharing his plight with God. It's important that we can go to God with the pains, with the burdens that we're facing. Because after all, what parent wouldn't want to know if their child was going through something? What parent wouldn't be distraught if their child was walking through something that was causing them pain and they didn't feel able to go and share it with them? But that's where most of us stop. When you're going through a trial, what we often do is we go to God with the first part of that psalm. We cry out and we say, deliver me, Lord, from this situation. My problems are surrounding me. I feel like I'm drowning and I can't get space to breathe. And I'm looking to you for answers. How many of us have done that? I have the amount of times where I have called out to God and said, God, I'm, I'm just in this desperate place. I need you to come and rescue me. And when you're going into a situation, how many times have you heard this phrase where people say, you just need to press into God more? Or here's the real, here's the real gem. Have you prayed about it? <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's funny that. I, just, I hadn't thought of that as a, as a Christian. But. And you're banging your head against a brick wall because you've been taking the same issue to God day after day, seeking him for answers and spending time in his presence. But you don't feel any lighter You don't feel that peace that passes understanding that you've heard spoken about. You don't feel the answers come forth. And often you don't even feel, see the breakthrough. And so you take these things to God and you cry out to him and you say, God, I'm going through this turbulent situation with my family, with my finances, with my job, with my community or church. And you're in pain and agony and you're calling out to God and you don't always feel the the peace. And you wonder why. And then you are led bit by bit over the years. The enemy likes to isolate you and then you become a little bit more despondent, a little bit more despairing. And one of the biggest traps of the enemy is you start to modify your theology based on your experience of God. So then you say, well, I know that the Bible says that he has peace that surpasses understanding. Or I know that it says God heals. I know that it says God delivers. But I have taken to God over the last however many years you know, of my life And I've pleaded with God, and the reality is I haven't seen those answers to prayer. Or you say, I kind of saw an answer, like there was like a half answer where God did something that met none of my expectations, and it doesn't always, it doesn't need to. But then what we do is we then modify our theology to say, well, God doesn't answer prayer in that way. God doesn't do that. And we bring God down to our level, and again, like I said earlier, where we make ourselves the arbitrators of our own discipleship, We say, well, that's how God works. That's where God would work. David takes his complaint, his trial, and his pain to the Lord, but he does not stop there. If we can get those verses up, we've got them broken down into two sections, the first and the the latter bit, so uh, verse 4 and then verse 5 onwards. Let me just tell you this. A few months ago, I was, um, I referenced it uh, in last week's message. I was walking through um, this season of my life where God had spoken words to me about something he was telling me to do. And I was in inner turmoil because I wanted to be obedient to God, but I didn't know how. It wasn't like a matter of like, well, if maybe I have faith. It was like, I don't understand how I'm meant to step into that God because I just can't see a practical way or even a supernatural way of how that would work. I, I, don't, I don't see how I'm meant to step into this. And so I was in turmoil over this. And um, it went on week after week. And one of my habits is when I go to the, get to that place, I like to um, run a bath and I like to just sit and I like to muse. I have some worship on and I'm just praying and I'm processing with God. And so I do that. Um, I run a bath, I get in and I start pleading with God. And like the first part of the psalm, I take it to God and I'm like, God, why aren't you answering me on this? And do you know the real frustrating part is, you know, My gifting is prophetic. So I was turning up at church, and I would hear God clear as anything for people if I was praying for them. And I would hear get words, and I'd say, God, I can get words for everyone else, but when I come to you and ask, what am I meant to do? It's like radio silence. There's just nothing. 
And so I'm just there, and I'm saying, God, it's like this feels almost vindictive. Like, I feel like you're having a go. Like, what are you trying to show me through this? Like, are you trying to build character? Because I'll submit if that, but like, I just want, Lord, I want an answer. I want you to tell me what I'm meant to do so I can be obedient. So I was going to God with the issue. I wanted his voice on it. I wanted his solution so I could be obedient to him. And so in my frustration, I just slumped back and I said, I, I don't know, God, I can't, I give up. I just can't hear your voice on this matter. Like, what am I doing wrong? And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and he said this. He said, John, the moment you allow an issue to become the primary focus of your prayer life, you've made it an idol. You see, even though I was going to God for, to talk about this issue, past that issue was God, because I had elevated that issue. I was going to, going to God for the answer to my issue, and I had elevated it above his place. And he says, I'm not going to answer you based on that. So, two things happened in that. The first is that I realized my perspective was all warped because the moment I'm only taking a singular issue to God day after day and pleading it before him, I realized that it has gained a bigger perspective than it should have. Because when you think of how vast and how great God is, how can any other situation even come close to holding that level of attention in our lives? So the first thing God showed me was your perspective is way off. The second thing he showed me and this is how it links into the psalm, is that in that situation, I repented and I was like, God, I'm sorry, I had no idea it'd become an idol. In my zeal, I was chasing after you. I wanted to be obedient to you, and I realized that I've elevated this issue that's in my life to become an idol. And I, and I repented and I said, what am I meant to do? What do I do? And he said, just worship me. Just give me the glory. Just praise and worship Put the issue, don't try and like sneak it in a back way, like I'm going to pray and worship you so you can like, you know, subtly, and by the way, I'm just bringing this back to your attention. He said, no, 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 just focus on me, just worship me. Put the other thing out of your, your mind, let it have the perspective that it's due, which is it's not an issue. In the eternal, it's not an issue. When David writes the psalm, he opens with his cry for help and lays his pain before God. But that's not the sum of his prayer, because he continues. Can we have that second part of the verse, verse 5 onwards? So he started with his plight, and then he says this. My heart, oh, it's, no, sorry. He says, be exalted above the heavens, God. May your glory be above all the earth. My heart is steadfast, God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing your praises to the nations. When we are in the midst of trials and we receive that invitation to come before God, to press into him, it is an invitation to leave our burdens with Jesus and then go give him the offering of praise that we talked about last week. Do you remember when I said that in that, um, that psalm where it says, I will give you a, a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving? And I said, a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it costs us something. It is in that process of coming before him, not, to give, not for him to give us the answers to our priorities, but to address the priorities themselves by putting everything else to one side and choosing to worship and praise because of the circumstances. In that place, our priorities can get aligned to God, and the situation might not change immediately, but our perspective does. It makes us open to being teachable from the Holy Spirit and removes the spiritual blinder that we place on ourselves when we get tunnel vision from focusing on our issue. I'll close with this. So if the, the worship team want to um, come back up, I'm going to finish in a moment. All three of my boys, despite the fact that they're aged between 
uh, nearly six and one and a half, are in that stage where they make, and it's so frustrating as a parent, I think parents will, you, you'll know who, what I mean, but you, they're in that stage where they make the same mistakes over and over again and don't seem to learn. They'll start by doing something that I can see is going to lead them to be hurt or it's like a behavior that further down the line I'm like, mm, that's not good. I don't want them to encourage that. And so I try and warn them. And I'm like, Ezra, Solomon, Wesley, don't do that. And then they go and do said thing. And usually the only thing that actually gets them to listen is when they feel the consequences keenly of their own actions. Um, you know, we, we had to rearrange our whole living room the other day. I came back from lunch um, and Rebecca had just totally moved everything. And I said, um, what, why? Uh, <laughs> and Wesley, no matter how many times we took him down, was determined to climb on the absolute furthest point of the sofa at an angle to reach the light switch. And it just did not matter how many times he took him down. I was like, no, Wesley. He was like tr straight back up that sofa, leaning precariously and, you know, trying not to, to freak out uh, like, so he doesn't fall. But he won't listen. And in his case, he's a baby. So we kind of, we, we take that for granted. But the thing is, children, at the time of you telling them that, their focus is so honed in on what they want. It's so tunnel visioned on their, their goal, they can't hear anything else that you're saying. I'm pretty sure that when I speak to Ezra and Solomon, it's like just in one ear, out another. They have no regard for what I'm saying. Even if I'm trying to dispense wisdom that's gonna help them in the long run, they don't care. Until the consequences of their actions become so severe. And I think sometimes when we as Christians get caught in that cycle of trials, one of the reasons why we have to step back is to see what God might be trying to say through it. Because sometimes our own behaviors, our character, or our systems that we've built up in our own life are actually harming us. And so we're caught in the same spiral over and over again. And we're like, God, why are you letting this happen? And God's like, if you took a step back, if you just worship me and allow me to show you what my priorities are in this moment, you might see that I'm trying to take stuff away so that you can be more fruitful. One of the challenges for us as we step and arise into maturity um, is that we are called to bring our attention and our focus back onto the Father. Not so he can give us the answers that we're so keen to get, but so we can worship him rightly and see his perfection highlight the areas of our lives that maybe we need to deal with. The call to arise into maturity flows from one of our statements. I wonder if we could have that up at sea. Um, it says this, we arise when we submit ourselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in all things, choosing to go where he leads, preferring the comfort of his presence over the safety of our own understanding. What we've talked about this morning is that. What does it mean to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit in worship, in teaching, in your job, in your adult life? Perhaps I overuse this statement because I'm def I've definitely used it over a couple of different sermons, but I, I, um, I really love this phrase. And I remind us that God gave us the Holy Spirit, who is called the Comforter, because he fully anticipates that he's going to send us into situations that are uncomfortable and require a comforter. So often, I think we as a church, we like to, we have the Holy Spirit. We don't allow him to do our job or his job because we go into situations that are uncomfortable and we're like, oh, I don't like this. And the Holy Spirit's like, that's why I was here. Jesus said, it's better that I go so that I can send the helper. We are designed to be made uncomfortable as we put to death the flesh so we can live in Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes in as the power of God to give us the grace to endure. I want to just invite you to stand as we go back into worship and I just want to pray for us. Oh, God,
Holy Spirit, we know that we're coming today from all different backgrounds, all different trials that we're walking through. You alone are the sustainer of life. Holy Spirit, we just ask for a release of the spirit of discernment in this room right now, that we would be able to call accurately, Lord, on you, and call into perspective everything that we're walking through right now, to see it how you see it, and to open ourselves up to be teachable, to be moldable, to be able to be discipled, Lord. And Lord, in the situations where you are trying to teach us something that might be painful, Holy Spirit, we ask, we invite the Comforter in right now. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. Sustain us, Lord. And so, Lord, as we go back into worship, to worship you, we place all those issues that we're facing. Give us the strength and the courage to lay them to one side and say, Lord, we will not elevate them to be idols in our life, but we will submit completely to you and choose to give you an offering of thanksgiving and worship. Because you are worthy. Because you are worthy, God. You will not be deprived and robbed of the worth of the praise and the adoration that you are due because of our circumstances. I will not make you the victim, Lord, of my circumstances because you are victorious in all things. So we elevate you, Jesus, and we say, be magnified in this place and have the worship that is due to your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.